<laughs> you can't ask why, you, yep. you know, uh, you just have to, and you guys all know this as well. You have to have the, you have to be working for a person who's open to those questions. Um, if you're working for uh, a manager or a leader of your organization who doesn't want to be questioned, then it's very difficult to be that devil's advocate who's questioning things. But that, again, if you don't have that constructive dialogue, you're not going to have a creative, innovative organization or a creative or innovative group of hockey players. Uh, yeah, it's a great topic. Uh, with it, I, I got to thinking about uh, something that was shared with me a long time ago, too. That was the idea that I've uh, learned far more from people who disagreed with me than people who did. So uh, it's so uh, one of those pieces that, yes, it's uncomfortable to be questioned as the leader in a building uh, at times. Um, and, uh, but I, it's a necessary thing for growth and, uh, um, the conversation I have with my staff on it is, uh, the only time that we won't, uh, explain the why in something is if, if it, we see as, as an emergency situation, uh, or when we, if we don't feel that we have the time, uh, unfortunately there are times in, in what we do that there are those. But most of the time, uh, it's that. The other thing that falls into, I find, uh, and it's uh, Chip and Dan Heath's Made to Stick book. I read it a few years ago that uh, they call it the curse of knowledge. And that uh, we as leaders, as coaches, as teachers, as whatever, um, will be thinking about something for far longer than those we expect to come to the same conclusion as we do. And uh, that that sometimes is well, it is always a challenge, and uh, um, and then I think that uh, many of us have also uh, faced it, uh, where you are not at necessarily the top of uh, the uh, uh, structure, so the managing <laughs> upwards piece uh, that falls into this as well, and uh, that that uh, you'll see that. Those who can manage upwards seem to to have more success as well <laughs> in organizations. So I I don't know, but no, it's a great discussion and and uh, and that, and I will let others comment on it. It's always great to have the people that work for you or with you. To feel comfortable enough to disagree with you because that's free consultative advice sometimes we go to pay for that kind of advice from people and we don't get nearly as good of advice because they don't know the structure and the organization you're working within as well as as uh, as you do and they and those people that work with you do I think Jordan brings up a great point about the timing of when those questions come as well and the appropriate environment. I know we're all coaches. If you're making a line matching decision on the bench, two centers out for a draw in your zone or trying to get the right defense pairing out for a certain situation, you don't want to have your players on the bench asking you why you're doing that. But you certainly want to be open to having that discussion with them after the game or on the, the, the you know, the debrief on the game to explain why you made situations at certain times but it's the same in management when you know if you're leading a certain um, decision making process that requires speed you don't always have time to explain everything you're doing and build consensus but you should be open to having that dialogue later on if somebody really wants to just to touch just to To add to that, um, at our level, and I've heard the same conversations at the in the NHL level. Um, you know, I've been four or five NHL coaches, and they've said we don't need to dis we don't need to agree in here. Once, but once we decide what is being said, then we are the united front when we're out. And there's been heated debate, like heated debate to the point where guys are ready to punch each other each other in the face. 
But when you get on the other side of the wall, then you're all a big happy family and you could still disagree, but you, you respect the other person enough to be able to say, okay, this, this is for the greater good. This is, you know, and then obviously the, the hierarchy comes in, into place, but yeah, I, that's just a, you know, just, just to share along those lines. And I, and I would say that that's getting back to the leadership thing, too. That's why it's obviously important to have real good leaders, because the same dynamic happens with the whole group, right? Once you decide on a whatever it is, a tactic, a strategy, match, um, a lineup designation, like you, you need to have those voices inside the room saying, hey, the coaches decided on this. We we got to jump on board and just do our jobs. Um, that's why it's a, it's unquestionable, really, that the right leadership group, whether they wear C's or not, can greatly, obviously, enhance your team culture and your ability to build your team. I can't agree with that more. It's hard to do sometimes. And uh, I'm concerned, Terry, um, I'm thinking of the corporate world. You've been in the hockey world. Uh, hockey's a game. You make a decision, the head coach is the final say in just being able to have input. And in the corporate world, it's about dollars and cents and the profit. And, and uh, sometimes you might be able to speak up and might not. But the life and death of it is, People will die in a submarine if they take the wrong route because they didn't listen to the people who had concerns because they didn't dare speak up. Now that's that matters, and so does the other thing. Uh, when you work, you want to be happy wherever you are in the hierarchy of employment, as an assistant coach or a teacher or a vice principal or a principal, and. Uh, I'm just curious about Terry and his experience in the business world uh, about the ability to feel a valued part and express yourself to the point where you understand the decision makers are going to do what they, they they will decide. But hearing you out means a lot to to you or me in particular. And then I'll go with the flow. I'll, I'll have that. Totally agree. The authority is going to make the decision, but not without thinking of all the other things. So, TJ, any thoughts? Well, um, to start with, I found uh, the corporate world, if you will, is identical to the hockey world, to the sport world. I'm, I'm uh, the last ten years, I worked for an exceptionally flat organization. Um, where there's seven of, us, seven of us that have an equal vote on everything. And it's just, a, it's really a show of hands and who wants to go in what direction. Pretty um, empowering. Uh, and everybody, if a decision goes against your vote, that's okay. You had your chance, you had your say, and everybody has the ability to speak up. I've also worked in the great big companies uh, in different uh, groups. Um, and, and, and I've seen the polar opposite where there's no communication. And, and I think it's important that it doesn't have to go your way, but as long as you feel that your voice has been heard, that makes the, the biggest difference. You can still function um, uh, and still feel like you're contributing if you've been able to voice your concerns or your opinion, and, and those opinions are recognized even though the final decision for a, for a different reason might go against you, um, but I've but I've been in those also those areas where your input isn't wanted, uh, appreciated, or listened to, and and those are organizations or groups that end up ultimately falling apart and don't have much much success. I think it's identical to sports, and I think the beauty of sports is. Dominic, this is when you've been an assistant, you're an assistant coach and you have a degree of communication that you're quite happy with now. 
in Stockton. Is that fair to say that you can speak quite openly and honestly and share your thoughts now? Definitely. Um, he, uh, the, the guy is, um, has a high level of emotional intelligence to understand the dynamic and the personalities of the group and um, is cognizant that everyone is, you know, has a, has a chance to share their opinion. Um, so mm -hmm. it, it lends itself to a really cohesive environment. So, but that's, that, that starts with our, our coach. TJ's back on. Whether it's sport or the business world, from my experiences, it's identical. You'll get way better input if, or better results if everybody feels they've got a say. Um, in, in terms of uh, one thing, I'll just want to, it came to my uh, thoughts. When Dave was talking about timing of assistant, or of captains, I had the, the AAA uh, female team that I coached about three years ago, and it, it was uh, quite an interesting dynamic because we brought in three new players that were clearly, without doubt, going to be our best three leaders on the team. And But they're all brand new to the team. And the dynamics, I ended up waiting till the first week of December to n officially name them. And we went through the process, got everybody's input late November. In my gut, uh, I knew who the three were going to be right off the bat. Um, but I, because of all the dynamics of three new kids into the team disrupting the culture and all that stuff, I hung on as long as I thought I could um, before I then put the vote out, got their input, uh, and... and um, didn't give them the didn't say you guys get to vote 100 percent here just that we wanted your players input in the decision um but it was pretty um it, it was interesting dynamics and i don't know if anybody else has delayed naming of captains i had a, i had teams prior to that where we had no captains at midget age girls but this team uh um, we wanted to go with captains and uh it was quite a process and still, even at, in early December, caused quite a ruckus as to who they who they were picking. Um, and we did we did, and I don't know if this is right to this day. We did pick a fourth captain, who we knew was going to be a bad choice because all the all the kids that had uh, were with the team the year before had shown no leadership uh, or care for for teammates whatsoever. Uh, but we did pick that token fourth captain to try to bridge the cultural gap within the dressing room. Uh, interesting dynamics. I don't know if anybody's got has lived through stuff like that, but it was the most interesting year I've had around captaincies. How were the last three months? You know, Tim, I th it, um, we were a game short of perhaps being my best year, but because we did quite, we didn't win that last game. I still got mixed feelings on the season because it was so it was such a battle all year long to win to get the kids to play for each other. And would would they would they have any recognition of that that they sort of eventually did come together as a group and um, would they be able to say you know what we didn't win that last game but we really made strides as a group, but they have had any recognition of that? Oh, I think there's no doubt. There, there's no doubt that the, as a group, the team uh, felt like it came a long, long ways. Part of it, and I, but I think as I feel, you go, man, it was so hard. And they, and they were at each other, you know, got better and better month to month, but it was, it was a load. So um, it was not my favorite season. Although it was within, you know, if we had carried it on a little bit, if we'd got to the nationals, it would have, I, I think, it clearly would have been the best, the most, the hardest work that I would have had to go on through as a coach uh, to get those results. Didn't quite get there. And then you go, man, that was a tough group to work with.
Thanks. They didn't get much easier the next year. No. <laughs> but the question I got is, did anybody experience that late delay of captains and all that stuff? Um, I've done later captains and it's it's been fine. Um, I do I chuckle a little bit because I've had varied levels of success at junior and the teams that I found the most challenging, similar to you, Terry, are the ones who did the best. Uh, the ones who again, maybe it's just the girls, the ones who were kind of easier to deal with, maybe didn't have as many issues, maybe didn't achieve the same level of success. So maybe that's a uh, Maybe a necessary, I'm not sure, um, in order to get uh, where you need to go in terms of performance on the girls' side um, versus everyone being warm and fuzzy. Um, but I've, I've delayed it as late as, well, last year I would have delayed it till November. Um, and, and, it, and like I said, it had very little change on the overall team dynamic. It, it only had a change on the kids who got named as letters and they got worse in terms of individual performance. Um, but that, that would have been late November last year that we would have named our um, our season A's. Interesting. Kim, you made mention of that earlier, how they their performance fell off. And it certainly struck me as in pro hockey when you'll often see players that finally get that big contract and the next year it just kind of falls apart on them. And I, and I think a lot of times when I when I hear that, I think, Often those players that are because now they're paid three times as much, they feel that they got to deliver three times as much, and they put more pressure on themselves to be a better uh, player and maybe in a role that they're not really geared for. You know, all of a sudden they're not going to score three times as many points, um, uh, and they were and they were put you know they were rewarded for playing maybe just a. A muck it up tough game but when they were given a bigger contract or or put in a position maybe even more prestige if you will no no i'm not sure if that's the right word but you'll also you often find players try to do more and maybe play better in areas that they weren't so good in that ultimately takes away from their own game I coached in 2016 that same team TJ's talking about, and I took him over with a month left, I think it was, and they lost four in a row. Everybody hated each other. The older players were bossing around the younger players and blah, blah, blah. And uh, Wally got me to take over, and there was an issue with, there was an issue with girls not staying in the room they're supposed to be in. Everything was blowing up, you know, when they got home, and that's when I took over. And uh, Haley Irwin and uh, Jessica Wong were my assistant coaches. We ended up going 11-2-1, and one, and we lost the provincial final 2-1 to one a game. We outshot them 26-13. And the change in, I don't know, just the change in their attitude like when we when we came back, Wally said, "What the hell happened?" They were all hugging each other goodbye and everything in the parking lot at Max Bell, and just you know, and I, the change in the attitude was just incredible. So I guess I'm just saying this to say things can happen on a team that makes them separate, and things happen that brings them together, and uh, you know, and that was an unbelievable experience that they did come together. Anyways, the dynamic, the dynamic of a cha team can change so much with just one little, you know, if everybody just decides you're going to be on the same page with each other. So any, any other views? The problem isn't the kids. The problem is the adult leaders on boards and the parents influencing them to create the entitlement 
and the lack of the team understanding and leadership that sports should teach you. So, you know, we can talk about how to pick these captains and pick them in, in minor hockey and, and, and even in pro. And uh, every organization has a structure. How flat is it? How communicative is it? Is really going to be critical to your ability to work together as a group of coaches and the players to work together as a team to succeed. And and it isn't it isn't life and death for us, but it really makes a big difference. And uh, so the leadership component. Uh, it gets back to that, know what you're there for, know what you're trying to do. And um, that's where it, it really does start at the top, but it has to be impl implemented at the bottom. And Alan is doing that with his one team or teams that kids in their program participate in because they establish how they're doing, uh, why they're doing, what they're doing and how they're going to do it. It's very clear. And the unfortunate thing is in the system, it doesn't matter if you coach a college team, those kids come up, there are problems, and we take them to the, it's the kids, but it starts as they grow up and learn. And uh, I think we've got to make, really do a better job with our young people and look after them better, respect them more, and educate coaches of young coaches to appreciate how significant a role they play in, <coughs> not in the X's and O's, but in, in the influence they'll have on those kids for their lifetime. So I'm done preaching there now. So, uh, Wally, thank you guys so much for today. I've learned, uh, I had a great learning experience and, and uh, <coughs> We're so privileged to belong to a group like this. I have to.